by ah. In order to understand the great paradox, the mind must be confused. Another paradox. How can you understand if you are confused? <laughs> you can. Because what is confused is the lower part of the mind which we use for our daily living and which is tremendously important because it is part of the divine mind. But from spiritual point of view, it is utterly useless. In the Upanishad, it is called the slayer of the real. And let the disciples slay the slayer. You don't slay anything. You transmute it, but it takes years. And in the meantime, one remains confused. Nice perspective, isn't it? What a power. OK. <laughs> so Sufism, because it is, I just told you, so confusing, can be taught in many guises. And Sufis do not stick to any one convention. There are Christian Sufis, Muslim Sufis, Hindu Sufis. They teach through religion, romantic poetry, and some scholars and in some schools, jokes and funny stories are told. Mullah Nasruddin, remember. <laughs> some stories are used to drive home one particular aspect of truth. It is taught in tales, in legends, art forms, even the products of artisanship. And every Sufi can tell from his experience that all these presentations are absolutely legitimate. But the outsider can easily ask himself whether this or the other group of Sufis are alchemists or members of guilds or uh, members of some religions or maniacs or jokers, scientists or what else. <laughs> now see what I'm telling to you today. It's absolute humbug, which is not. I hope we will somehow work ourselves to the, at least partly to the essence of it. Sufis have been murdered, martyred, driven away from their homes, had their books burned, have been proclaimed as heretics, accused even of political crimes even today. Our teacher told us, even today, great Sufis are always where they are needed. Great Sufis are in politics. They are everywhere in commerce, in banking business. They are everywhere where trouble is, where there is trouble. They are now in Lebanon. They are now in Egypt. They are now in Ireland. They are hidden especially this particular line of the Sufis, Nakshibandis, to which we belong. They are called the path of the masters. They are completely hidden. And nobody knows what we are doing, because we work in the night. Our meditation is in the night. And it's said that it is said that the great Sufis, where if they forget to look somewhere at the part in the world, then trouble starts. And all of us who belong to this part of the Sufi automatically begin to wake up in the night to meditate. Nobody tells us to do that. We wake up and we meditate. And things begin to happen. Meditation in the night is very, very important. There are not so many thought forms. You know, there is stillness. You can concentrate better. And you, then you fall asleep meditating. And then your soul goes where it ought to go, to our teacher. But the soul doesn't go anywhere. Everything is interpenetrating, this world and the other world, and the beyond after which we die, into, into which we die, I must say, like that, like that. Because we die into the beyond somewhere. Well, I hope it's not too confusing. I'm confused myself now. <laughs> so as I said, they have been murdered, they have been martyred, they have been chased away, and even accused of political crimes. But 
They are gentle people practicing harmlessness. A Sufi sees God in everything. He will never hurt anybody's feelings. He'll never give bad, a bad example. He is kind to everybody. Never will he interfere with people's beliefs and convictions because his only goal is self-realization, the union with God, and God is everywhere. And salvation, which is the realization of the ultimate truth, can be achieved in any religion, in any philosophy. Now look how broad-minded. They will never convert anybody. For the roads to God are as many as human beings, said our teacher to us. It is quotation from the ancient Sufis. The road to God is as many as the breath in the, of the children of man. So you see, there is no need to convert anybody. I don't need to say my God is better than your God. And by the way, you know, we all are idol worshippers. The concept of God of everyone in every one of us is different. If I say the word God, immediately you think of what you think is God. And your image of God will be very different from mine. It can be just a void. It can be nothingness. It can be the Christian God. It can be the... It can be Lord Buddha. It can be any one of your teachers. Because in Hinduism they say the teacher is like God. He's God. Somebody asked Kabir, who is greater, your guru or God? And Kabir answered, for the moment my guru, because it is he who will take me to God. Relative, everything is relative in life. Here we are back to Einstein again, eh? <laughs> so uh, reali self-realization can be achieved on any path. There were very great Christian saints, very great Hindu saints, enormously great Buddhist saints. And let's hope one day there will be saints, but without being boring. Just happy saints, full of laughter. All Sufi gatherings are full of fun, full of laughter. Our teacher used to say, those who segregate themselves from the rest of humanity and go and meditate in solitude, in a cave or a forest, for, for instance, they become one-sided. Life in this world has been created in order to experience the human being needed to experience it. The s our soul needs experiencing. By running away from life, one cannot reach the highest state of perfection. It is by reconciling on all levels the permanent and the non-permanent, the opposites, that one can achieve the purpose of life. The greater the limitation, said the teacher, the greater will be the perfection. And I just read outside in the office a lovely saying, the greatest help to adult education is children. Mm -hmm. My revered teacher had children. Sufis marry and have children. They believe that if the life closes tightly around you, if the limitation is such that you have to labor hard to conquer the limitation. Salvation is near. This body and this plane of existence is such a limitation, such a prison. Why should we create even more imprisonment by creating habits? Why not be free? If I have no tea, well, I don't drink tea. I drink just water. And so on, you see. Mm -hmm. How much can be said about that? I have no time. The self, said our teacher, is within and without. This is, of course, a very well-known fact. And by injuring others, you injure yourself. 
For instance, he said, it is like in a room around the walls of which are many mirrors. In one mirror you look thin, in another broad or with distorted features, but it is all you. And the shape depends upon the nature of the reflecting medium. All this was Guruji saying. And he also said, our way is the pathless path of the birds in flight. One day I remember a large crane flew by, and he was speaking about the path, and he spoke in English but for a change, because usually he spoke Hindi to his followers, and we Europeans sitting there understood very little. And he spoke about the path, and he said, pointing to the crane, can you say exactly where he flew just now? Exactly. Nobody, of course, could. He said, our path is the pathless path of the birds in flight. You cannot define it. Look what a saying. It is a tremendous saying. Our path is the pathless path of the bird in flight. <coughs> it's poem. It's trackless. That's poetry, really. No ceremonies, no initiations, no dogmas, and no doctrines. Look at that. We are not initiated. Our teacher told us he began to write most beautiful poetry. He said, I began to write beautiful poetry. People said it was beautiful. As soon as my teacher knew it, he said, aren't you an idiot to write poetry? Who is a poet? Poet is nothing. It's still on the level of the mind. Stop it. And I stopped. You know, when you practice spiritual life, but I don't mind, no, only Sufis. I don't mind, I don't mind, I don't mean, sorry, I can't even speak. <laughs> I don't mean only Sufism. When you, when you are on a spiritual path, Things begin to evolve within you, possibilities, capacities of which you have no idea. 